Hey guys, Brian here for Better Chess Training. And in today's video, I'm going to be sharing a game by none other than Mikhail Tal. And this is uh, first in a series that you guys voted for. I put a few players that I wanted to do a series on, and you guys voted for Mikhail Tal. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy and let me know what you thought in the comments. Okay, our first game of Tal's that we're going to look at is. Uh, from the 1958 USSR Championship. And this was a, another strong Grandmaster FM Geller. And this is maybe not the most uh, well-known game out of uh, this era. He also played uh, future world champion uh, Boris Spassky during this tournament. But I thought it was pretty interesting, and it kind of had a combination of both uh, the tactical complexity that we kind of no tell for, but also there are certain uh, positional nuances that uh, kind of underlaid all of these tactics. So I'll try to express some of that. I have to admit, uh, going through a lot of his notes as well as analyzing this with the uh, chess engine, uh, his game is very complex. And um, well, let's just get right into it and what I mean. Uh, Anyways, uh, he starts off, uh, so Tal is playing white here, uh, Geller is playing black, and starts off e4, e5, I'm not going to spend too much time on the opening here, knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to b5, so uh, the Roy Lopez, a6, bishop to a4, knight to f6, all pretty standard, and white castles, bishop to e7 is played, and now rook to e1, bishop to b5, Bishop to b3, black castles, white plays c3. So all of this is pretty standard and has been played thousands of times. Uh, d6 is played, h3 is played, uh, preventing this bishop to g4. And here, knight to a5. Again, pretty standard, attacking this uh, bishop and also clearing the way for the c pawn to try to fight for control of this d4 square. Okay, bishop to c2, c5, and d4. And again, this is all very theoretical. Thousands of grandmasters games played in this specific move order, as well as um, both back then as well as today. So uh, here, well, actually right after, so here a lot of moves are played. Queen to c7 is probably one of the more popular ones, uh, adding some protection to this e5 pawn. But here, Geller chooses bishop to b7. And here, if I could just read from, uh, and what I'm looking at here is uh, life, my life of game of Mikhail Tal, where I got his annotations from it. And here he writes, uh, early, well, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. There was an earlier game in the tournament, and uh, after queen c7, Knight bd2 is not dangerous for black. And so let me just show you that variation. That's queen c7, knight b to d2. So, therefore, in the present game, he wanted to try out what he calls a dubious idea following an immediate blank blow. Since white also did not obtain the advantage in this game, one is forced to the conclusion that white must block the center by the advanced d5. And then he, uh, the author, uh, I think this was edited later by John Nunn, uh, offers this variation, d5, knight to c4, a4. And again, this is, again, more a little more standard nowadays. Knight to b6, b3, bishop to c8, and queen to e2. And that's from the game Kasparov versus Grishuk from Khan 2001. So a little bit of an older game, but this is sort of how it's played the, more often um, with this blocking of the center. Okay, but uh, go back here to the game position just to show you um, some other ideas here. Queen c7 usually uh, used to protect e5, so it's, it's still pretty safe here. d takes e5, d takes e5, and then knight takes e5 doesn't win a pawn after queen takes d1, rook takes d1, bishop takes. E4, 
and this simplification in the center equalizes for black. Okay, again, going back to the game position. So Tal tries something out different here, and uh, the engines don't like it, and he calls it dubious as well, and that's B4. And actually, uh, this only was played in my uh, database, was only played one other time that same year by Tolush. So I'm guessing that he saw the Tal game and wanted to try it out. He also won that game, but I think it was more because uh, he's a great player as well. In any case, uh, not a great move, but it, it's going to lead to a very exciting uh, middle game here. Okay, so C takes B4, C takes B4, and this knight takes up residence here on the C4 square. So what do we have to do when this happens? We want to attack it and undermine it immediately with knight B to D2, and that's what Tal does here. And here uh, he offers knight takes D2, bishop takes D2, Rook to c8, and d5 as being kind of a normal variation. And this would lead sort of to a normal slight advantage for white with this lock center with white having a little bit of a space advantage. But here, uh, Geller actually plays something uh, a lot sharper here. He plays d5. But we're going to spend a few minutes uh, looking at a, some of the variations here. Um, what does this do just on the surface? Well, uh, it opens up this bishop here along this diagonal. So, so that makes this piece more active. And also it's going to prevent, because it's going to prevent white from ever closing the center. So that in and of itself makes it a lot sharper. And definitely a lot of calculation needed to be done here. Um, and here the engines assess this as already being about equal. So let's look at a few variations before we look at the game variation. Now, Tal in his book gives knight takes c4, b takes c4, d takes e5, and knight takes e4 being uh, unsatisfactory for white. And uh, pretty much um, this is supported by the engine. I think the general idea, we have this strong uh, pass pawn here, and this knight is in a strong position, and white will have to give up the two bishops in order to get rid of it. Uh, in addition, this pawn on e5 at some point can become weak and in general um, doesn't promise white really too much compared to what was in the game. Not a terrible move, but uh, definitely agreeing with Powell's assessment that it was not, not great for white. Another one, another idea though, is actually attacking the e5 pawn. D takes e5 and then uh, some analysis here, knight takes e4, knight takes c4, and then b takes c4. Um, and white can go wrong here, for example, b takes, so this position here is about equal, but if, for example, we just take here, um, b takes e4, knight to d4, bishop takes b4, uh, will win some material as well as gain the initiative for black. So uh, this definitely isn't a way to go either, but if we go back here, uh, this position itself is about even, and white can play a move like a3, for example, to bolster the four pawn, but again, it can be very sharp. Um, I think black can consolidate here. Queen to c7, um, just getting off this file, bringing this rook over, and putting some pressure on this five pawn would probably be uh, good enough for black to uh, equal. Okay, let's go back to the game. So what did Tal play? He played e takes d5, okay, undermining this knight and opening this rook along the e file here. Okay, he takes e4. Now, knight takes c4, b takes c4, and queen takes d4. Okay, so at this point here, uh, white is up a pawn. So black has to decide. He can take the e pawn or he can take the b pawn. Now, let me show you what happens. He ends up taking the b pawn here with the idea that this d5 pawn will be weak and black can attack it. But uh, let me show you what happens here. Um, Tal gives knight takes d5. Instead, queen to e4, g6, 
uh, stopping the checkmate threat. Bishop to h6, rook to e8, bishop to a4, and then knight to c3. Okay, forking the bishop and the queen. Well, we have queen takes b7, knight takes a4, and then queen to c6 attacking this knight and uh, with a, a slight edge for white at this point. A very complicated play. I don't necessarily like giving these long variations, but uh, I wanted to show you what Tal was thinking in the book. So he does say that this this could be stronger here, but uh, we also look here at uh, some other ideas uh, that I was looking at. Bishop takes d5, and then queen to c3, just protecting this b pawn, seems to give um, seems to give white a comfortable position. Not necessarily winning or anything like that, but definitely not something to be uh, afraid of either. These two pawns are connected, although again, they can be attacked fairly easily. And then this C pawn, I think, can maybe come under attack eventually. So, going back in the game, in the game, Geller chose to take the B pawn. And now this is going to lead to some fireworks. Of course, he's attacking the rook here. And something just to think about this rook, this rook just moves out of the way. I think that definitely would have been, you know, a, a fine move here. And but after queen takes d5, um, you know, we could have some type of predation. But uh, this actually would favor black here. I think bringing these pieces here and uh, winning a pawn instead um, here instead of taking on d5 in white. And try something like queen to h4 with this discovery, and then eventually working on this pawn as well. Uh, just a few ideas there, but in any case, it kind of gives black some of the initiative. So, what does Tal do instead? Well, what Tal typically does, he sacrifices something, and here he sacrifices the exchange with rook to b1. Uh, skewering these two bishops but of course black takes this bishop on e1 and now here is what i was talking about earlier uh taking on b7 so for the uh exchange white you know when when i don't know what a lot of uh, when i sacrifice the exchange often it's to get some type of attack um but here he actually does it uh, almost solely on positional grounds to get this rook onto this strong, onto the seventh rank, which is what we want to do a lot of times. And we'll see later that actually plays uh, quite a crucial role in this game. However, when Tal plays like this, in general, this style, uh, he often gives his opponent counterplay as well. So let's see how Geller, remember, Geller is a very strong grandmaster as well. So let's see how uh, he fights back. Rook to e8. Now here, I, I guess I was looking at this, and the engine kind of agrees. Something like just dropping the bishop back out of trouble, having won the exchange. But um, here, and not that move. E6 is strong for white. Advancing also giving a kind of an anchor for the rook here at some point. And so here, uh, black would challenge probably. And after this exchange, bishop to f4, we have some compensation for the exchange. I'm not sure if it's uh, uh, full compensation, but uh, with these two bishops, very active pieces, a white can fight on. But let's go back a little bit here and see here, White can, uh, dropping back, there are some little traps for white as well. For example, queen takes c4, and then we have rook to c8, skewering the queen and this bishop. Well, the queen has to stay in contact here, and after rook to e8, bishop to e3, uh, queen takes d5, we see here the black pieces get a lot of activity here with uh, minimal compensation for white. So uh, something like that, this bishop to a5, instead of what was played in the game, I think makes a lot of sense. However, uh, rook to a8 also 
fairly strong for black. So here, b6 again. Now here, again, it's not that you're going to promote this pawn, but what this does, and we'll see this later in the game, is it gives uh, white kind of uh, an anchor to, or he's, uh, he, white can outpost his, his rook here on c7 and e7 and attack uh, along this seventh rank. And it's fairly um, fairly safe. He has his bishops to be able to protect it at some point. So it's not really weak at this point in the game. Maybe a little later uh, that could be the case. Now here, white um, or black does have a little bit of a threat that we need to be aware of. And that would be rook to e2. And we'll see this a little later in the game, but here it is not well-timed. And what I'm going to do is uh, let you take a look at it for a few seconds. If you want to pause the video here, try to figure out what is a White's reply here. Then go ahead and do that. I'll, I'll wait a couple seconds. Okay. Well, if you pause the video, I hope you were able to find takes C4. The idea here is now we have this attack on king, which will eventually lead to mate, as well as attacking the rook here. So bishop takes f2 check, and then king to f1, forking the rook and the bishop while maintaining this threat. So there's no more, uh, well, no more really effective checkmate threats. Of course, uh, black can sacrifice here on e1. That will not lead to anything good for him. So black instead chose uh, queen to c8 here. And here, white makes a little bit of a uh, mistake here with bishop to g5, which this could have led to to an advantage for, for, uh, for black. But uh, let me show you some of the analysis here. And the, the idea here is that uh, Tao doesn't fear this taking of the rook because he thinks he gets too much initiative here with um, bishop. Let me show you his line. Bishop takes f6, and then he analyzes g takes f6, and then queen to h4, threatening here on h7. But then, um, oh, g takes f4, queen to h4. And here, uh, bishop takes f2 check, takes f2, then h6 is good enough. After queen takes h6, we actually have rook to e4 giving back a little material, because remember, white has sacrificed a lot of material to uh, get this attack on the king variation. So this is what Tau gives um, as why he's not afraid of that. But here, uh, here after bishop takes f6, I'm sorry, after queen takes b7, bishop takes f6, uh, with the help of stockfish, I have to admit, we have rook e2 now. Now we don't have that trick with queen takes c4 because this rook is gone. And for example, queen takes c4, bishop takes f2 check, and after king to f1, we simply have here, bishop to, or I'm sorry, rook to e6 attacking this rook. So if this rook retreats, bishop retreats. And here uh, we have the black has won the exchange, of course, uh, but also uh, actually he's won a couple, one exchange and looks like um, a rook for, well, it looks like he's won two exchanges here. I'm sorry. I just gave my math straight, and that should be sufficient for victory. Okay, uh, let's go back to game position. So that's what's wrong with bishop to g5. So what should white play instead? Here, uh, he can do an in-between move here with rook to c7, attacking this queen. After the queen, say, comes to 6 now he can develop here to g5 if he wanted to. Okay, but here he could also just take here on c4, and then white would enjoy a slight edge. But I think 
uh, you know, let's go back here to the question. This kind of uh, typifies Paul's play, at least the, when he was younger, which is where this game came from, is he always was seeking out the initiative. So he valued the initiative and the attack and development much more than material. Hey, does that remind you of anyone else? Very similar in a way to uh, Morphe. I actually think in a way Morphe uh, was a little more of a positional player than Tal was. And we can even see here that, um, as we see here now, computer analysis uh, can shows us that some of these ideas, or at least this idea, was not necessarily sound. But imagine uh, playing over the board with a limited amount of time, trying to calculate all these variations and finding them, uh, even for a grandmaster, would be very difficult. So here, I uh, thought this was a nice illustrative position of Tal's style. But here, uh, let's actually see, I, because Geller also, I think, uh, believes <laughs> believes the uh, believes the hype, and he plays rook to e2, and of course, threatening. Bishop takes f2 check, forking the queen and king. And here, uh, white plays this rook to c7 in between move. Okay, queen to e6. By the way, if we went ahead with bishop, uh, bishop takes f2 check, we just take with the queen. And then after queen takes c7, he takes c7, rook takes f2. King takes f2, we see that uh, um, black is up. Take a look here. He's got the two bishops for a rook, and two bishops for a rook. So it's about even, but with these bishops' activity, this pawn here, uh, very advanced, it will be pretty straightforward. Let me just go a little further with that. Rook to c8. Bishop to f4, and let's say uh, something like knight to d5 here. Bishop to f5, just threatening this rook. So black has to give back material in order to survive. And now we're just uh, up a piece for a couple pawns, but uh, these pawns here on, uh, or the pawns here on c4 and a6. Are very weak. Okay, getting back to the game. So rook to e2, rook to c7, queen to e6, and now knight takes e1. Okay, rook takes e1 check, pretty straightforward, king to h2, and now rook to d8. Now very concerned about this advanced pawn. Bishop takes f6, and here uh, this is actually, uh, black can actually hold this position, uh, and again, it, you know, easy to say with a chess engine help and a hindsight, but uh, let me just show you with g takes f6 was played in the game. Uh, queen takes f6, queen takes f6, g takes f6, and then seven. Then here, the winning move or, or uh, a very strong move here would be um, something like king to g7 or even. King to f8 works as well, um, because bishop takes h7, we have rook to e2 attacking a uh, white's pawn. So uh, black can hold this. Now, I don't think it's winning for black, but it's uh, definitely, uh, I think I'd prefer to play black in this position. Okay, let's see here. Um, Oh, just to show you here as well, if this rook to c8, because I actually just thought about this, this rook to c8 threat is not a big deal because, okay? Okay, let's go back to the game. But instead, so that would be queen takes f6 would hold for black, but instead g takes f6, and now um, here we have another tactic, and I want to give you a moment. If you want to pause that video, uh, Try to find out what Tal played here. Very uh, strong tactic that apparently Geller missed in calculations. 
Okay, here uh, White played Rook takes e7 with this wonderful skewer. Okay, and here maybe he was banking on some type of because this pawn is pinned, he was banking on something like this Queen takes e7, and then with the idea that if we take back, then Rook takes. But here, uh, just have Queen to g4 check. Avoiding that and in this queen, now we're up, essentially up a peak. But uh, with this queen and the bishop against the two rooks, it is very dangerous. Let's go back to game here. Seven. So instead, queen takes d6, queen takes d6, rook takes d6, and rook takes e1. And here, uh, white is up a piece. So pretty straightforward from here. I'll just play through the moves. Rook to d2, attacking this bishop. Uh, attacks the bishop first. Then after he takes the f pawn, now he uh, uh, is going to basically trade this a pawn for the c pawn. And advances a pawn here. Hits him with this check. And here again, the rook comes to the seventh rank. And here, black resigns. This bishop is going to come to e5. Of course, threaten. F7 on. So uh, that was, uh, that's our first game uh, with Tal in the series. Uh, March is going to be the month of Tal. So uh, expect each week I'm going to put out a video with one of Tal's games. I wanted to pick one of his earlier games, something that kind of showed his aggressive tactical style. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. I definitely enjoyed uh studying and analyzing that game uh, down below you can check out a link to uh, this book i think gave him a kyle towel uh, definitely a book i recommend and i've got a link to that also uh, patrons you can download the pgn file for this game with my analysis and some comments and i also quote some of the uh, commentary and analysis from the uh, book as well uh, with some corrections that i did with the chess engine so definitely check that out uh stay tuned for part two of this series next week and have a great day